this is Lady Boulay, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Please hit the notification bell so you'll know when new videos are uploaded. Thank you for your thumbs up, for your comments, and thank you for sharing the videos. Thank you for all you do to support the channel. I am surprised by the interest in the Boulay and in Mr. Steve Coakley's work concerning the Boulay. For those who haven't heard my story, I am a retired elementary and middle school teacher, and I say that because I spent my entire professional life interacting with young people, so it's good now to be interacting with adults. I love teaching, though, so when I retired, I wanted to do something that was stimulating and, and keep me still connected to education, to teaching, and to learning. So I started this channel to focus on the rich history and culture of our people, African Americans, descendants of slavery. The history is so expansive that it's just always something to talk about. I'll think I'm going in one direction and then I'll get pulled into another direction. So it's very exciting to be studying this culture and our people. And... The history includes, really, the reason it's so expansive is that our history includes just about everybody on the planet. But the main focus is African Americans. The boule is also a part of this rich culture. I wasn't acquainted with Mr. Coakley when I did my first video, but his name kept coming up in the comment section. One subscriber asked me to do a reaction video to his work, so I went to his body of work, his videos, his articles, and so forth, and I learned about his critique of the boule. And the boule is um, one of the beginnings of this elitism that we do have in the African American community, but we don't talk about it that much. So in my last video, someone said that Mr. Coakley had spent 30 years researching the boule. I want to say first and foremost that any black man that spends 30 years researching anything is serious about it. I would even say passionate about it. So I would never disparage or disrespect a black man's work, especially one who's so clear and so passionate about what he believes. And by the way, I appreciate the person in the comment section that clarified the word revolution to mean Mr. Coakley's desire to liberate black Americans from an oppressive system. And I accept that explanation. And my disagreement with Mr. Coakley does not mean discredit. I'm not trying to discredit what he's saying. I'm evolving and learning about his ideas, but that doesn't mean that I'm trying to discredit what he's saying. I, I don't, I'm not qualified to do that. I also acknowledge that he had more contact with more people that would be aware of how things and people move in this society, including members of Sigma Pi Phi. He had more contact with those individuals than I do. I admit that he had a wider range of experience than I've had with members of politics and business. But my discussion was based on my studying his work, my lived experience as an African American of a certain age, and my understanding of how the United States government works. So I respect Mr. Coakley's passion and desire for transparency in the African American community. And I hope that that will be taken in the spirit that it is meant. As for the boule, we have a long history of black people getting a little education and letting it go to their heads. Sometimes they don't even have to have an education. It used to be, and I live in the South, uh, and <laughs> somebody would get a job at the post office or a factory, and, and, and they'd start bragging and putting themselves up on a pedestal. So this kind of elitism is, re is well documented in the black community. And we know that sellouts were and have always been among us. 
cliches like pay to play or you scratch my back and I'll, I'll scratch yours or break me off a little something. We know about that. They've always been a part of our existence. So the boule was a combination of up from slavery elitism, possibly getting a little education and letting it go to their heads and therefore wanting to be powerful and important. People like this are perfect targets to be used as patsies, flunkies, or tools for a greater purpose. And this brings us to the United States government. This republic is young. Compliments to our ancestors who put the infrastructure in place in record time. This country quickly became the most powerful nation on earth. Anybody that threatened this republic would would be dealt with and it would be and they would be dealt with harshly so that's where i differ somewhat with mr coakley i don't think the boule had that much power i think they were pompous pretentious elitist but i don't believe they had any power dr w.e.b du bois's name comes up a lot when you talk about the boule as he was an early member of the fraternity. Based on what I've read of him and his interactions with people, he was an elitist and he was hard to get along with. And he was also, he was a Pan-Africanist too. This is why I, I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't like Marcus Garvey because Dr. Du Bois was a Pan-Africanist or he claimed to be because eventually, remember, he moved to Ghana and he died in Ghana. But as a mixed race person, I think he was conflicted because he was not white enough to pass. So he was as disruptive as he could be as a black person. Now this is my conclusion and opinion based on what I've read about him. He spent most of his career as a professor at Atlanta University but the black faculty didn't, faculty didn't like him. They said he thought he was better than they were. He ended up getting fired from Atlanta University. Then he worked with the Niagara Movement, which was the predecessor to the NAACP, but he couldn't get along with those people either. And then when the NAACP was formed, he went to work for the NAACP, but he couldn't get along with Walter White, who was the leader of the NAACP. So he was a difficult cat to get along with. Eventually he started working with foreign governments as he got older and he was supposed to register his organization with the government and he wouldn't register. So they ended up indicting him for basically espionage or being a spy. So Dr. Du Bois, you know, he was a difficult person and to blame him for anything treacherous would really have to do I would have to do more research on that because I don't think I don't think black people trusted him, the people that worked with him didn't trust him and the government didn't trust him. So I don't know. The the the, the, the verdict is out on whether or not Dr. Du Bois had any power and if he had any they would take it away because he was so arrogant and so hard to get along with you couldn't trust him. So I don't know. When I think about Marcus Garvey and the Boule, I always go back to Malcolm X. Malcolm X fell out with the Nation of Islam and the leader, Elijah Muhammad, and he, he felt like he had enemies in the Nation of Islam. His house was bombed and he began getting threats on his life. At first he blamed it on the Nation of Islam, but as things began to escalate, just before he was killed, he said, and I'm paraphrasing it, that the things that are happening to me now, the Nation of Islam does not have this kind of power. So food for thought. Three black men assassinated Malcolm X. But how many of us really believe that this was really about the Nation of Islam? The power in this country is and has always been with the United States government. The mighty they of the power in front of, on, and behind the scenes. They set the rules and they run the show. Yes, I know how they use people to get things done, but that brings us to black people. <laughs> I hear over and over again that the boulet is controlling black people. 
Ain't nobody controlling black people. If we had some serious gatekeepers and somebody was controlling black people, black children could play in the streets without getting killed. Black women could live without the threat of violence, having their eyes gouged out for not wanting to be bothered or getting shot and killed for moving on with their lives while they're pregnant. And, and, and young black women getting knocked in the head with skateboards and shot for who knows what. Where are the gatekeepers is what I want to know. Let's take it a step further. Look at the property, how property is being kept up in some of the neighborhoods that we live in. A few years ago, my husband and I were in Chicago, and we were leaving the city going towards Maywood. There are a lot of single family homes in those neighborhoods, these cookie cutter type homes. I don't know if they're called brownstones. They're not connected, but they're beautiful homes. They were full brick houses with dormer windows or bay windows. The lawns were well manicured and the shutters were painted. The yards were free of trash and debris. The neighborhoods were just beautiful. They were just tree-lined neighborhoods. And as we passed through, our family member that we were visiting said, that's a Greek neighborhood. That's a Polish neighborhood. That's an Italian neighborhood. That's a Mexican neighborhood. And then we came to the black neighborhood. And guess what? We ain't listening to nobody. Even in the South, black people complain that when they get ready to buy houses, we have to find a place in or near white people so we can live our lives in peace. It's a shame, but it's the reality. Black people who have homes or have inherited family property in predominantly black neighborhoods very often have to sell and move out. Crime, violence, disrespect from the young people, old people scared to come out of the house and scared to go back in. And that is what we're experiencing now. Gone are the days when we lived as neighbors and didn't have to lock our doors as we as as was the case in my neighborhood. We can't do that anymore. Where are the gatekeepers? I was having a discussion with some friends and we were saying that we would really like to live in black neighborhoods, progressive black neighborhoods, like we used to before the so-called civil rights movement in the South. We had very fun living in our segregated neighborhoods. We really did. So, I, you know, I don't know whether where this change came. But anyway, as we were talking, we were discussing about some people saying, well, black people move away from the neighborhood. And one of my friend's husband had had an experience in the black neighborhood. And one day he just came home and said, we got to get out of here because I don't want to have to kill somebody. That's what that's what she said. He said, but it has to be noted that a lot of us pr prefer living among each other because it's, it, it was fun. I enjoyed going to a segregated school until the schools changed. I, I liked it. So I'm not one who feels like I have to run off. To somebody else's neighborhood but my point is you have to do it or else you have to take measures that many people don't want to take so like i said i don't know who the good gatekeepers are but the people that are actually living in many of these black communities are calling for them because they would love some gatekeepers and no i'm not missing the point Gatekeeping means you're controlling who comes in and who goes out and what's going on. And we don't have that. We wonder out loud why we can't police our communities like the Asians do. The answer is because the Asians respect each other. They have gatekeepers. When I taught Asian children, they made it clear that there is crime in the Asian communities. They're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. But they put a clamp on things at a point. They know how to put a clamp on things because they respect the people who are supposed to be the leaders of their communities. We don't have enough respect for each other to listen to or do anything another black person says. And that is one of the reasons why we, don't, we miss out on a lot of things that we should be having and doing because we are a powerful group in this country. We really are.
but I just take issue with the idea that there are, in, there are gatekeepers or that they have ever really been serious gatekeepers when the deacons and the preacher and the teachers were living in the communities. Then they set a, a standard. There was something to model it after. But if those people try to live in those neighborhoods now, they will get a different response than they did in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. It's just a different crowd. So I'm saying that if there are gatekeepers, or let, let me put it like that, would the real gatekeepers please stand up? Because I, at this point, I think there are many people who would appreciate them. Well, I want to know what you think, and I know you will let me know. And we don't have to agree. We can continue this conversation if you like, because I think it's worth exploring. Because it's important. It's it's important how what's happening in our communities and what's happening with us as a people. So please let me know what you think. Subscribe, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video. And also email me at ladyboulet8596 at AOL.com with any ideas or suggestion for videos. And as always, have a great day.